one of the dark aspects of human nature is, you know, people like, like, you know, whether it's tragic or just negative news, it, it captures the mass attention better than a lot of these positive stories. So you got, you got negative perception, negative news, which then drives people to click. And then you have the algorithm, which continually feeds that. Um, and, you know, honestly, we've always, we know, we all know this perception is reality, right? Reality is not necessarily, you know, all about facts. It's about how people perceive it. So when you have a generation of young folks entering into our, our profession, you know, against great odds, um, but they've only and always been digesting these feeds. Think about that. We call it a feed. You know, it's interesting. What you feed your mind is intriguing. So be wise with it. Hey, guys, check out the 2023 Street Cop Conference, April 23rd through the 28th, Gaylord Convention Center. It's going to be the event of the year. Keynote speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Medal of Honor recipient, Navy SEAL Jason Redman, Fox News host Tommy Lahren, Marine Corps Special Forces and Leadership Coach Cody Alford, Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff David Clark, and Sheriff Mark Lamb. It's going to be one hell of an event. And on top of that, we have all of our instructors and additional instructors from other companies going to be at the event, giving you everything they know for you to have a successful career and get the results you want to get in the field as a police officer. On top of attending the event, you'll get face-to-face -face time with every instructor attending the event, and all the keynote speakers will spend time with you. We got special events all week, giveaways, nightlife. It's going to be really, really worth your time, energy, and effort. I promise you, you will not regret it for a second. To register for the conference, check out streetcop.com, click conference, and everything you need will be there on the homepage. If you are looking for a room, just click book a room. The block has been sold out at the Gaylord Opryland Convention Center but there are many hotels nearby within a walking distance of the event. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. We will see you there. You trying to be a street cop? Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benito. I have with us today, Lieutenant Corey Flowers. And we had a little time before we started the podcast to talk briefly. And I'm going to point it out right now. He sounds just like fucking Matthew McConaughey. You actually right now kind of look like him, too, which is fucking strange, dude. Are you like his cousin or some shit? No, but I'll take it. And if there's any royalties associated, I'll also take that. This is like pretty uncanny. You hear it all the time. Yeah, I've heard it a couple of times um, since since that. And I'm a fan of that fella since he got a. Uh, you know, he got big, the, you know, so I'm not, I'm not going to say, uh, you know, shut it down, but uh, I, I've heard that a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dude, he's the smoothest dude I've seen in a long time. Listen, bro. I'm glad my daughter's not even close to your age. Cause I, you'd be a, you're a fucking charmer, bro. I got me charmed. I'm like, I want to go on a date with this guy. Uh, that's kind my man. I appreciate it. Knowing you as I do, I'll take that in the right way. So there you go. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about you, where you grew up, who yep. you are, what you do, and all that shit. Yeah, so I'm from uh, I'm from here in North Carolina. Uh, I'm working now in the with the Greensboro Police Department, but I'm from here in the heart of North Carolina. I'm I'm a Tar Heel. I went to school uh, in Chapel Hill for four years. The uh, one of the greatest basketball legacies in the country, and so that's that's where we're that's where we are. I've started working here in the agency in in the 1900s in '99. Uh, but I get to say that a lot of people don't. So I was in the uh, police academy here in the in the in the agency that began in '99. Uh, like everybody else, you know, that's about a seven month ordeal. Got out on my own in 2000. Um, and in the last 23 years, 22 and a half years, I've my career has been extremely heavy on the intelligence and tactical side of operations. I've never written a speeding ticket. I've never written a seatbelt ticket. You know, those things are important and it just vital. gets better just and better. Not, it just gets better and better. Yeah, it's just not my thing, you know, and I've got friends that do that. And that, that definitely serves a, a great purpose. It's just not what has held my attention. Um, so I've done, you know, I've been fortunate in this agency to do everything I've wanted to do. Uh, I was a detective for a couple of years and then I, I became uh, I got heavily into gang investigations and was assigned, was selected to our criminal intelligence squad, um, which is one of the first like proactive street level intelligence squads that was founded in our state. It was founded back in the uh, back in the late 70s. And, you know, we track, monitor, investigate anything weird. So any subversive groups. Um, my specialty was white nationalism, white supremacist activity, outlaw biker gangs, sovereigns, Antifa. We were we were dealing with Antifa before that name, that word was in, you know, in the public sphere. So I was an intelligence detective working hand in hand with uh, the federal the federal agencies here in the state to investigate um, a lot of the you know hate crimes, bias based crimes, that kind of thing throughout the throughout the southeast, primarily east of the Mississippi River. 
uh, primarily the southeastern seaboard. Uh, so I did that for about six and a half years, seven years in the middle of my career. Um, at the same time, I was assigned to we have a, a, a part time on call 24 seven SRT team SWAT team here in the city. Um, so I was a, a member of that 30, 30 man uh, team for about nine years. Uh, I ran the SWAT training program for our unit for the last two years I was assigned. Um, got promoted out of intelligence, went back to the street. Um, I worked one dark year in fraud. Um, and I say that because it's just it was not my thing. I was not good at it. I was not I'm not that smart. Um, so got out of there. I was promoted to sergeant. I ran our downtown bike squad for a couple of years, which is a lot of fun. But it's, um, you know, giving out tourniquets like Pez candy, dealing with gang shootings, you know, pretty regularly de dealing with mass crowds and riots. A lot of times, you know, 15 fellas on bicycles trying to manage crowds of eight to 10,000 folks every weekend. Like it makes for good stories. A lot of fun. After that, I, I went to uh, I ran one of our street crimes units for about a year, which is a undercover unit where we uh, we pursue the most violent gang members in our city or gang affiliated folks who are armed. We try to capture them and corner them while they're armed and send them to federal prison for as long as possible. Um, very fulfilling job. A lot of, you know, a lot of chases, a lot of pit maneuvers, a lot of, uh, you know, near and also critical incidents. So a lot of fun, but, you know, very rewarding, locking up the right dudes for a, a long time, making the city safer. Um, since then, the last couple of years, I've been promoted to lieutenant. I used to I say a lot, you know, I'm a lieutenant now. I used to be a cop. I remember what those days are like. Um, but I've been assigned various places as a lieutenant. I was an executive officer of a patrol bureau for a, about a year. I was a watch commander for a year here in the city. Uh, our city's about, our city's the third largest in the state. We've got about 315,000 citizens, give or take, about 700 uh, sworn police officers. So that job's a lot of fun, making a lot of decisions all night long. Um, and now I'm assigned to uh, I'm in charge of re our recruiting efforts here in the city. So I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of talking and, you know, conversing with folks about how to draw the right people into our agency and into our trade craft. So that's uh, that's 23 years in about three minutes. But um, very fun career. When I first jumped into this uh, from right out of college, I said, I'll do this for as long as it's fun. Um, and honestly, man, I think it's the best job in the world. I got friends that do all kinds of things and, um, we get together and, you know, they don't, they just don't have stories and they want to hear our stories because this is, this is the job that your friends are going to pay 15 bucks each to go to the movie theaters this weekend to see the latest movie about our job. You know, all the greatest TV shows, which are legion now are all about this job. They're not making, you know, they're not making a lot of TV shows, blockbusters about, hedge fund managers and, you know, realtors and that kind of thing. But I, I, I very much value uh, the stories we get out of this job. Being that you're in recruiting, I guess we'll go into this a little bit right now to start. I don't think it's any secret that recruitment has been plagued in the United States of America. Yep. Um, I would actually even believe that it probably is not just in this country. I believe that I've heard from European police officers who follow our group and or in a group and follow us and communicate with us. We have a lot of people, Germany. Uh, a lot of European company uh, agencies, Canadian, obviously, as well. It seems to be like they're having recruiting issues as well. Yep. So why do you think nationally, from your on your opinion, we are seeing such issues with recruiting? Yep. And I, I, you know, for me, it could be a conversation where we can go over all sorts of things. And I might have some different thoughts on why as well, or in addition to what you're going to address. And then how are you guys doing it differently? Yeah. So, yeah, a couple of things. First of all, yeah, you're absolutely right. As far as this, we, we tend to think this is a regional or an American issue, but it is a, a you know, effectively a, almost a worldwide issue. I've got I've got uh, investigative friends in Australia. We share the same you know conversations. I've got investigative friends in New Scotland Yard. We talk about the same thing. Everybody's having trouble drawing folks into this profession. In my opinion, the so the the big thing is that like the typical American thinks, oh, well, it's a dangerous job. People don't want to get into that. And that's wholeheartedly false. Um, the people that are drawn to this profession are the ones that like the idea of a chase or a, a gun battle or a fight like that's not only it doesn't, doesn't not only not scare them away, but they're drawn to that. Right. That's part of the appeal of our job. So it's not that right. It's not physical harm, physical hazard or danger. What what in my opinion, I've seen and we we, we hear this from the recruits that you know, valorously come through our doors is they all say, and they believe this, they believe, oh, well, everybody hates y'all. Like, this is the worst job. What, man, what a tough job. This is the hardest job. I see it on social media. I see it on Instagram and Facebook and all of the, you know, the social media, of course, but then the traditional legacy media passing the same 
just nonsensical narrative that, you know, the, the police are, are the culprit of all injustices and we're, you know, you know, inherently and systematically bigoted. Like that's that those are those statements are, and you know this, Dennis, they patently false. However, when you have a whole generation of, you know, 20 to 25 year olds who were trying to draw and their entire feed of news and world awareness is based on social media. Well, you see it online constantly. You tend to have you tend to just think, well, that's real. Like that must be real. And I, I have these conversations. I tell these folks, look, that it's not real. Like it's not real. If you wear this uniform today in our city and I I've, I've, literally if I go stand downtown where you know, good, good hearted, clear, clear minded Americans are walking to lunch and sharing, you know, lunch breaks and going to eat and hanging out. If I just stand there, five out of 10 people stop or at least say, man, we appreciate what you're doing. Thanks for your service. Like that's the truth. But that is not it's not you know put out there by the folks, you know, in charge of social media and then in charge of, of, of legacy media. So we've got well, I'm going to jump in here real quick and say and I'm going to address why that's not put out there. Yep. And let's unpack that a little bit further. And I don't mean to interrupt you. I, I generally like to get people to go on a roll, but I also don't want to circle all the way back around to this. I know you're going to keep going beyond this. Yeah, good. But people have to understand something, how algorithms work and how advertising works. Yeah. So when you understand this, you'll get, oh, okay, it's a little more clear as to why uh, police are put on this, you know, essentially chopping block nonstop. Yeah. So- one, everybody's interested in the police. There's no question about it. But number two, your algorithm, anybody who's engaging on social media, we're influencers in some sense, right? Maybe we're not we don't have the biggest following in the world, but in the law enforcement space, street cop training has a lot of attention. What you'll see is the algorithm recognizes when we do something good because now it's more of a TikTok style algorithm. If people are clicking on it and finding interested or watching a little bit longer, what they do is they serve it to more people. What they want to do is keep you engaged in the platform. Yes. And it all comes down to one thing at the end is money. See, TikTok hasn't really started to capitalize on their attention. How it works is they build attention and they start putting prices on sponsorship. So the more attention they get, the more valuable the product becomes. So if you can get people to stay on your platform and not switch back to Facebook or not switch back to Instagram, that's why they're hurting because TikTok just became so much more uh, entertaining. Yes. Um, and I believe they're not hurting to the sense where they're just hurting in general in the macro sense of things. But it's the same thing with the news. You'll see the news media try to toss some stories out there. It's very simple. They'll see what kind of sticks. Yes. And once they see their algorithm saying, all right, people are clicking on this. Like right now, it's the Idaho murder suspect. Now it's going to be the unclassified documents. Yes. Um, the Idaho guy's actually falling off. The guy who killed those four poor, those poor kids, he's falling off the map. And all you got to do is go to CNN or foxnews.com to see what's the most trending thing. Right now, in the history of the United States of America, cops are not the hot topic issue. They're still around, but not the hot topic. So you won't see a lot of police topics. Anything, the stuff that's actually yeah. uh, seems to be catching a lot of traction is uh, pro-sentiment police. Poor These poor cops, this guy was killed. Hmm. Uh, let's not forget, they ran in, they were heroes. All of a sudden, everything's changed. You know, people have to pick their fucking morals and stick to them, but, and, and pick the side they're going to be on. Don't look so easily persuaded by what the news tells you. Yeah. So that stuff now is doing well. And that's why you're seeing more of it. So you're just being fed yep. what they want to feed you and what they know you're emotionally going to continue to watch. That's right. So they can sell advertising space to organizations to sell products. Yes. It's a whole fucking thing. Just so we're clear. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Right? So, Yep. None of it's true. It's just how it works. And right. when you understand that, people say, oh, I mean, when Russia invaded Ukraine, yes. I mean, it was running on fucking CNN for three weeks. You couldn't find anybody <laughs> touching that thing at a fucking 10 foot pole now. That's right. They don't, nobody care. It's not that Americans don't care. We just don't see it anymore. So we're just like, oh, it must be okay. That's it's right. a fucking disaster over there. I mean, people are being slaughtered. Yes. Human beings are losing their lives. And but nobody oh, must not be happening. I mean, yeah, real news doesn't even get reported and it's Correct. all bias. It's about one thing, either to push an agenda or to sell. Yeah, that's all they yeah. want to do. If it bleeds, it leads. It's a, yeah. There's a reason why it says that. So that's my quick rant. And I wanted I wanted to throw that in there. Why you're seeing that in your feed. Yep. Corey Flowers, carry on, Lieutenant. Yeah, I mean, and you're you're right, Dennis. So uh, and one of the dark aspects of human nature is, you know, people like like you know, whether it's tragic or just negative news, it, it captures the mass attention better than a lot of these positive stories. So you got 
you got negative perception, negative news, which then drives people to click. And then you have the algorithm, which continually feeds that. Um, and, you know, honestly, we've always we know we all know this perception is reality, right? Reality is not necessarily, you know, all about facts. It's about how people perceive it. So when you have a generation of young folks entering into our, our, our profession, you know, against great odds, um, but they've only and always been digesting these feeds. Think about that. We call it a feed. You know, it's interesting what you feed your mind is intriguing. So be wise with it. But we call it your feed. So you have this feed and, you know, it, it's perceived as reality. So we have to overcome that. Um, you know, I've said I've said for years and I don't know the proper platform to do this, but I think movies and TV shows are one avenue. But I feel like, um, you know, one of our greatest assets in law enforcement that we don't exploit enough is just our stories. I mean, there's heroic stuff going on this morning in my city. No doubt about it. There's some 22 year old out here doing miraculous things. And we don't talk about that enough, in my opinion. And I don't know, again, the exact platform for that, uh, whether that's town hall conversations or produced, you know, formats, but man, we, I mean, these young guys and gals are doing great things and we don't talk about it a lot. So it's interesting how to trying to counterbalance all that negativity. There's one thing that's refreshing when we talk about social media, I follow an account called it the good news movement. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, I, I thought about this a long time ago and I'm glad that somebody did it. Uh, it's not my forte because it's not my space. And when you pick a space, you got to stay it and stay the course to make yep. sure that you do not because I could do a thousand things, but I got to make sure I stay focused on street cop training. But yeah. uh, Good News Movement is one of those Instagram accounts where I suggest people will follow. I have no affiliation with them, but they really do put nice stories up all the time. And I got to tell you, it's refreshing to see they have a lot of, I mean, they get hundreds of thousands of likes on every story they put up. That's great. And those are the stories we should be emphasizing because I got to tell people, when we were doing police training during the uh, George Floyd protests and the anti-police sentiment in this country, you know, I, I would speak to these groups of men and women. I'd say, we're in a room with a hundred people. Now there is, everybody looks different here. You all have different shades of skin, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different genders, different religions. But the one beautiful thing about this profession, I think which draws a lot of people to it is, it doesn't matter what you look like. Everybody in this room is fucking family. Yep. That dude will come to my fucking house and be accepted. No matter what he looks like, that girl over there, I'll go to her, her house and her yep. parents maybe take my shoes off at the door and sit on a fucking carpet yes. right with them and pray. And I'd be thrilled to do so, but I'm one of them. And that's yeah. the beauty of this. And I said, so outside of even this room, when they're trying to convince you that ev there's just so much hatred in this country, I'm not blind to the fact that there is obviously people have their personal opinions and there are some bias on both sides or every side of the coin. Can't point to one race or one gender or one religion. Yes. But what I can say is, you know, it's not 1943 anymore. Uh, we don't have Jim Crow laws. And you come to my house and watch my kids play. You would, it essentially is what Martin Luther King Jr. envisioned. Yes. And, and that's how beautiful it is to live in this country. Yes. So, well, they have you convinced that we are at some kind of civil war amongst the races that right. couldn't be further from the truth. What I suggest that you take a look at is starting to use a filter of who are good people and who are bad people. Yep. And, even having compassion for the bad people, try to figure yeah. out where that comes from is a very, very profound skill as an adult. And that's right. You, know, you got to start seeing things differently. You got to stop listening to the fucking garbage yeah. they pump into your brains. That's right. You know, I go on foxnews.com. I'm not going to lie, but I'm looking for stuff that I can take and push my agenda and put my twist on it. Namely police stuff. We, yeah. we avoid politics. We don't want them to do it. I don't give a fuck what they do. Right. I care about people, especially police officers. And if something happens that's good or bad, we like to emphasize why this happened, our compassion for why this happened, how proud we are these cops did what they did, and remind people over and over again, like, we're not the fucking bad guys. So stop listening to these assholes right. who are, they're horrible. They're not held accountable. Yeah. They are biased reporters. They do one side reporting. I experience it to this day, this week. Uh, yep. An article was published and it was fucking biased again. We can't even, they're so untrustworthy. I mean, look what Vice News just did on the fucking bullet in El Chapo's window. You said that thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Where they yeah. stuck the 50 cal in like in the hole. Right. You know, yeah. uh, they've reached out on several occasions to try to interview me. And I'm like, you guys are so full of shit. You cannot be trusted. Even the times that I have tried to trust, literally anything you find that you can try to twist, that's what you do to me. 
Yeah. So I tell them, typically they want to speak to me and come in and do an interview. I'm like, yeah, we're going to record it too. We're going to record mm -hmm. you while yeah. you record me. We're going to put our version out. You put your version out. Yeah, unedited. They better match up, right? Right. Yeah. They better match up because that's they right. don't, dude. And that's what people need to understand is like, stop believing everything you see. Stop mm -hmm. believing all the hype or hearing things, right? There's a great saying, believe none of what you, half of what you see, none of what you hear. Yep. Oh, um, yeah. You know, even, even beyond that now, I tell folks all the time, don't believe everything you think. I mean, honestly, like, you know, they're they, like you spoke to earlier, the algorithms, all of the just the mountainous negativity online that seems real, like it will creep in and you'll start to digest that as real. It's not real. Question all of it. It's fair. Um, but, yeah, it's it's interesting what we're talking about, the, uh, you know, just the, the family aspect, the team aspect of this profession. Um, I've, I've been saying that for years, you know, when I first entered policing, there was honestly like a lot of intangible perks, like people were always wanting to buy you something or treat you, you know, there was a lot of, you, you know, you didn't have to worry about getting speeding tickets from other officers because they understood, you know, we would care for each other in that way. Now, wholeheartedly, like across the board, a lot of that is gone. Um, and it, that's unfortunate. That's just part of how society. And I'm going to say that real right? quick, yep. that maybe you guys are experiencing that in the South. Um, and I hear that over and over again. And I'm still going to also stand up for everybody who doesn't believe that and say, I know that at least half or better, maybe even 75% or maybe even 90% yep. uh, still are like, hey, man, we get it, right? We're on the same team. That's but right. I'm going to tell you this, brother, the blue line, although there might be some kind of inner bullshit and there's your, you know, like inner office yep. agency bullshit um, where they're, everybody's got caddy games going on. Right. You would be hard pressed to find anybody in this state. And I'm going to even say from Maryland up through Maine that would ever give you a hard time and show you nothing but respect. And that includes all state troopers. Cause I know they get a bad rap too. Interesting. These That's are incredible. our troopers, dude, our troopers here are like the coolest motherfuckers. That's great. You're like, everybody's on the same page, bro. Everybody's yeah. bros in the, yeah. the girls are the bros. Like everybody's a bro here. Yeah. Now, sure. again, somebody like listen is going, well, that's not true. Blah, 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 blah. I'm telling you, you are real hard pressed to find stories like that. You know, it really doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And that should go. And I, you know, and it's, you know, like you said, it's the very few, you know, badge heavy, bad apples, bad experience. And now they won't retribute. Like I get that. But I mean, I tell the young folks all the time, the only perk, that they, you know, the society can never take away is if we take care of each other, right? You right. call me, I'm literally going to drop what I'm doing and solve your problem and help you out. If you call me for a professional piece of help on a case, I'm going I'm to help you out because that's what family do. You call me for a barbecue restaurant recommendation in my city, I'm going to give you a proper recommendation. And I've got pals all over the country and I tell them the same thing. I'm like, we have to, you know, we, we teach from sea to shining sea. And I tell folks all the time, you call me like I, I would be offended if you call somebody else in my agency. If you know me, I want you to call me. I will stop what I'm doing and I'll help you out. And I also expect that you'll do the same because that's what family does. That makes sense to me. Um, so that that's kind of my vision. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to hear that in the north. Uh, it's degraded a slight bit in the south. But well, I'm going to tell you where they really lost a lot. of It was like out in like Wyoming. Again, there's good guys and girls out there, but. Brother, you start having like Idaho, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, they're fucking lost. Like they don't even know what it means to fucking take care of each other. Like, like literally, I've heard horror stories out there. And yeah. I warn people, you go out there, be careful. I travel the country. You know, people know who I am. I, you know, I'm retired. I got a retired tin in my pocket. Yeah. I ain't fucking with these people. I, I follow this. You know, I'm not I just don't trust them. Not that I go here and get in a car and do 103 everywhere I go. Right. But as far as the blue line goes, I can just tell you one story as you were talking. We had a gang conference in the town that I worked in and a friend of mine, she was at the gang conference and I said to her, uh, she goes, oh, we're at this class. Well, I'm working tonight. They were hanging out in our town at this bar. So they came out. I got to meet. I think the guy was the guy who was there is that heavy set fellow does gang work. He's the one they made the movie on colors. So yeah, I know you're talking about great. Yeah, movie uh, no, yeah. 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 So a lot of them were hanging out outside at the time. People were smoking a lot, cigarettes and stuff, you know? So I said, where are you guys staying at? They said, we're staying at the hotel down, down the road here. And there was no Ubers or anything back then. Yeah. And I said, how'd you guys get here? Like we, we all took cabs. We got to get another whole set of cabs. I go, no, you don't. I called my friend, John Maddie, uh, Maddie on the radio. It was like a Friday night, Thursday, but my, actually it might've been during the week. I said, John, um, the whole screen's fucking white. We had two yeah. man cars. Yeah. Now I said, there's about 15 or 20 people from the gang conference at this place. But dude, I got to tell you, I, it probably wasn't the most pleasant ride to have to get shuffled back to your hotel in plastic cages. 
But we brought a sea of police cars up here yep. and one black and white after another over and over again. We probably took and I probably took three, four different crews yep. up and down the highway. It was about three, two miles down the road. Yeah. Um, we probably designated 10 or 12 black and whites for the next 30 minutes to give everybody rides back to the hotel. That's as it should be, man. Exactly right. You're caring for your family. That makes sense to me. Please. Those stories are great, man. One of my one of my good pals runs the training academy in Philly. And uh, my parents were up there in Philly. They're the best, bro. By the way, let's just be clear. He's going to say it. Philly guys are them, NYPD. These are the best dudes you could ever ask for a oh, favor yeah. for. They go above and beyond. They're fucking yeah, great. Shout out to Sergeant Dan McCulloch. He was up there, and I called him last minute. Like, last minute. He's running the training academy. I said, hey, pal, my parents are in town. What can you do for him? He 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 took them all around town. VIP, proper cheesesteak, like, gave them the behind the scenes. I mean, those. I've been in Boston doing some training. and Oh, they're good, the too. Those guys are dudes. good, too. Yeah, they yeah. upgrade our tickets at the gate. Like, I... Uh, my wife and I were at the Empire State Building in New York a couple of years ago, and I, I I was strapped. I had my gun, and I didn't realize you couldn't take it up there. I ran it to the local precinct house, and I said, hey, you know, talk to the desk boss. And I said, hey, Sarge, can you hang on to this gun? He's like, yeah, I got you, man. No problem. I mean, that's as it should be. That's care. Bro, that's how we – listen, bro. I'm telling you, that's how it is, and I'm proud to say we yeah. haven't been disturbed by that. And I think that things like this and people live with 450,000 people listen to this. Yeah. Um, you might be pessimistic to our, our profession. You could fucking kiss my ass. I really don't care what you think. Um, but this is the stuff that we don't have much as a profession to hold on to. Yeah. Um, this is what it means and why people get drawn to this profession, especially yeah. here because you're in that family now, yeah, you right? You're just in that. Yep. And be very clear. We're not covering you up and get into a bar fight and split somebody's head open with a stool. You're done. Yep. There's not, we could do. Got to go. Right. Right. It, yep. like, it just is what it is like that. Like, yep. but at the same time, like, yeah, you, you didn't know the speed limit was fucking this. No big, like it's, it is yeah. what it is, brother. That's like right. it happens. That's and, right. and people would say to me, well, you know, you give somebody else a ticket, but you won't give a cop a ticket. Let me just say this. I don't give anybody fucking tickets. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like, let's be clear. <laughs> your, your fucking mom's getting a break. Like he's getting a break and she's getting a break. Right. Um, I remember I had a lady run a red. I almost, she almost T-boned my police car. Yep. I whipped back around. I pulled her over. I came up on the you know passenger side of the car. I want to point that out. And she's like, I'm getting a ticket. I'm like, you're not getting a ticket. Just be, she's like, I was on my phone. I go, hi, listen, everybody fucks up. <laughs> That's right. Having a tough morning. I said, I'm on my phone sometimes too. I fuck up. Just, she's like, are you really not going to give me a ticket? I go, what is that going to prove? You are already <laughs> fucking terrified. That's right. What do you give you a ticket for? I said, yep. just, you get, take this as a lesson learned. Don't let me go yep. back and give you a $400 ticket. Yep. Let's put the phone down, pay attention. You almost T-boned the police car. That's exactly like, right. I can't believe it. Yeah. No, and I've got, you know, same deal, man. In the last several years, uh, you know, vehicle stops like that, that end like that, um, people are astounded. They're like, oh, you're not going to yell. No. And I tell them, I always tell them, I'm like, look, no, it's reasonable. Like you just said, Dennis, it's reasonable. But do me this favor. When we part ways, just tell the story. Just tell the story. That's all I'm asking. Tell your pal, tell your coworker. Look, I got pulled over. The dude was totally reasonable because that's kind of the antidote to a lot of this nonsense. But, yeah, that's that's being reasonable. That's being a human being. You know, that's the goal. I mean, people, people are like, oh, we need to get public support more on our side. I'm like, well, maybe you should stop running traffic and writing tickets for nine over the speed limit. You know that's what I mean? A, like, that's a strong point. Yeah. Listen, you want you want to. I get it. Guys doing 68 to 25 through a school's up. I'm, I'm with 100. You got me sold. I have kids. Yeah. Right. But come on, man. Like you guys are going out being fucking hand jobs. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that interdiction, you know, this is your pretextual stop. That's what we're using. Whole different. That's a different game. Yes. I would mm -hmm. I would argue that you should stop for two over the speed limit if you see a vehicle that you suspect is involved in criminal activity. Yeah. Um, but come on. You will. You know, the question is, do you think you're helping us? You think people right. are proud that you're going out and yeah. you're slowing people down on the highway? They like to see the cops out there. But you know, good there are those people. Um, who, right. Right. There are those people who are like dollar. fucking lunatics, right? Yeah, you know, it's just, just right. if you want to help, you are not helping by take, you know, I think people understand they get caught doing 30 over the speed to get a ticket. They're probably not super pissed at the police. Right. People yeah. get really irritated. I had a guy get pulled, my friend Frank gets pulled over and um, he's driving his family to Tennessee. So yeah. he calls me because I got pulled over and got a ticket for one over the speed limit. Oh, wow. Wow. Yes. And so I said, are you serious? He goes, yeah. So I call, I get in touch with the guy. Somebody got me in touch with him. And I said, bro, he goes, well, well, you know, uh, it's a, it's now a construction zone. So it was that he was uh, one over. Now he's 11. And mm -hmm. I said, so he's 11 over. You got a guy who donates to the fucking PBA up here like a lunatic. All his friends are cops. He's got all these cards on him. He's a great citizen, a great human being. He's got four kids in the car. 
Yep. His wife's a doll. She's like motherfucking Teresa. What are we uh, you know, what and, are we and this is what you guys, and I literally said, I never forget this conversation. I went, and this is what you guys think is police work. Right. Like yeah. go out and get some fucking drugs. I said, dude, you can come to our class yeah. and I will, t- dude. And Frank was like, look, dude, there wasn't a soul out there. Right. <laughs> I went into the fucking, I went into the rest area. I came out and into cones. But I didn't see the sign. The guy self-admittedly said, sure. well, the signs like where the rest areas, you'd have to drive yeah. through that to see the sign. <laughs> and I'm like, bro, you guys are such fucking clowns. What are you doing? Yeah. What a terrible like, use of time. This is why here. people hate the fucking police. Because right. it's guys like you. And you know what the crazy thing is? They just don't know any better because that's what they think police work that's is. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good they, point. They that's don't. They that's right. That's I didn't know mean. any better. I wrote tickets. I'm embarrassed as fuck, Lieutenant Flowers. Right. I've written tickets that I shouldn't have. I have people intervening. Like, you think you really need to write a ticket? Citizens. And I'm like, don't bother me. I'm writing a ticket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, damn, that guy was fucking right. He was right. So, That's right. <laughs> we've all done it. I've run yeah. random plates thousand times a day. I've written tickets when they didn't need a ticket. I worked click it or ticket once, and I, like, couldn't get tickets out because my soul. I needed oh, the yeah. money, like, the 50 yeah. bucks an hour. Yeah. And I came back, and they're like, how many tickets you write? I'm like, three. They're like, you're supposed to write 10. And I'm like. I can't do it. Like you're not working this ever again. I said, I know I already made a decision. I (laughs) can't, I can't go out and get people tickets. I just, it's not in my fucking soul. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the street cop podcast, do us a favor and go give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us, tell a friend, we don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, street cop training, give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast. And it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally. And we also entertain you as well. And I've always, you know, honestly, between me and you and all the 400,000 people that have watched this, I, I've always had an ethical dilemma charging people with things that I routinely do anyway. So that's why I never <laughs> yeah. wrote a speeding ticket because I tend to speed and I don't, I don't wear a seatbelt. I'll, I'll say often. We'll leave. That. So I have a cha- it's a challenging conversation for me to charge somebody else for doing that. So yeah, just being reasonable and being like a human being, like what a novel idea, you know? I mean, we got a tough job, but you don't have to, you know, you don't have to lose your soul. I don't think that's wise. And it's not helpful, you know, for, for like you said, for what we're trying to build back. I think that makes sense. People need examples. They need a podcast like this to listen to it and go, you know what? Uh, man, these guys are right. So yeah. as a company, we don't just train you. Wait, this is how you catch bad guys. This is what guns look like. Yeah. This is how you fuck find stuff in a dark web. This is, we say, hey, look, we're in our 40s. Everybody here is pretty much in their 40s. Yeah. Put an arm around you. Come with us. We're going to show you what it looks like to be good. good cops, yeah. right? That's Overall, good. what we think good police work looks like yeah. um, and how you should behave towards each other and towards the public. Yeah. And you don't got to be this tough guy to right. get this job and get it done right. So let's and people say like you guys really guide a lot of us. I mean, really appreciate it because nobody sure. has guidance. You know, nobody's giving us any guidance. You're coming That's out and you're just too. playing this fucking guessing game. Right. That's good to hear, man. And there's not a lot, of, not enough of that going on. Right. I mean, our our profession has, you know, traditionally been one that's, you know, that it, it's it's passed on. It's not there's a lot of stuff in the manuals that we have. But, you know, passing on that knowledge, that firsthand knowledge, that firsthand ethos of how to deal with just life and, you know, as challenging as it's going to be anyway. And then folks and um, yeah, you need to pass that on. That's that's our that's the gift the street's given us. And we need to pass that on to the next generation. I think that's I think that's exactly exactly perfect. There's a video that came out recently. I play it in class now and uh, kids out. There's a protest and, you know, he goes after the guy's like, I need your ID. And then he starts chasing the guy. He's deploying a taser after he misses. The sergeant shows up and the sergeant's like, what are you doing? He's like, he didn't give me his ID. He's like, for what? And then he says, like, because he's trespassing. He's not. It's public property. Right. (laughs) And so people watch this and are like, oh, my God, this kid. I go, "Okay, let's let's just stop for a second. Yeah. You have served this kid up with enough training to ensure that he's going to fall on his fucking face. Sure. He was out there thinking what he was doing was correct. Right. Now, yeah. I'm glad the sergeant was there to stop and intervene to no longer have a Fourth Amendment intrusion because he was wrong. Yeah. But the question I have during class, and I bring this up, is said, why didn't anybody tell him this before it happened? That sergeant yeah. That's good. clearly knew yeah. that he couldn't do that. But why didn't he tell them that before? Like, if you run into this, just yep. so you know, we can't compel ID. This is a 
Yes. Why didn't we talk about it? Why is there still videos of First Amendment auditors and these cops still coming out going, yeah. you got your ID? Like, still what the fuck are yeah. you doing, dude? You're going to be on YouTube. You can never get off YouTube. That's not, yeah, know, know the law. You know, we tell the folks all the time, know the, like, know the law. Like, that's your scripture. You should know that. Yeah, but Further on top of it, like, you can say it, but if you know it and you're not sharing it, you're fucking worse than they are. A hundred percent. So, like, totally if you're a yep. supervisor or you're running a training academy or you're head of an agency, um, you know, and you're not, acknowledging that like we fucking failed yes. our cops don't know what to do they're handcuffing this blind guy over a walking stick you know we're demoting the sergeant you know right. he's responsible you took chevrons you should know i'm sorry i'll stand by that all day yeah but you know as the sheriff you got to come out on, on on camera and say like we fucked up yeah 100%. Right? like she should have known that we didn't yeah. cover that in the academy not only did i fucked up the fucking academy fucked up because they've been yeah. swinging a stick at a bag for fucking 10 weeks screaming, get back. That's we'll right. never do that here on the road. So. No, and we, yeah. And we, people respect when, you, you know, when you tell somebody why you did something or you apologize, like, j honestly, people respect that. Uh, you know, I've always told the young folks, look, go, go forth into the street and make creative, assertive, innovative, aggressive mistakes. It's fine. Right. You're, you, if you're operating ethically, morally within the law and you make a mistake, it's fine. First of all, don't lie about it, right? Learn from it, tell the truth, take responsibility, and then we'll learn from it. And then you know what I'm going to say? Go forth and make more different, but more creative, innovative, assertive mistakes. And that's how, that's the best policing, right? That makes sense if to your me. Administration, if your administration submits to having a policy like that, where they're, you got guys going to work, literally shivering like fucking chihuahuas walking on eggshells yep. because your fucking lieutenant's such a piece of shit that he'll write you up your socks don't match because he's a lunatic man so you can't go to an environment like that and you know it's crazy dude it just breaks my heart to hear about these fuckheads that are literally the reason why people aren't remaining in this job yeah they're i for the first time in my life in new jersey where getting a cop job is like hitting the lottery it's a six-figure paying job yes um People are literally quitting. They're just not dealing with these people and their misbehavior and lack of leadership yes. and lack of humility. Right. And for some odd reason, people think that these fucking insignias on a uniform, you think I'm anti-administration, nothing to do with me being an anti-administration. Yep. What I'm saying to you is there's an administrative responsibility when you put shit like that on your collar, 100%. that you've got to be better yep. and you've got to be a better leader and you've got to sit down and take time to learn how to lead. Yeah. Lieutenant Flowers as being a fucking perfect example of what it sounds like to display leadership. People listening to this, if you're not listening and you're a current leader and you're a dick, think about what he's saying. Do you employ that? I, I always think about this thing. This guy, this guy, Joe, I used to work for. He was, he was a sergeant, went to lieutenant. They went to leadership school and he made a joke. He's like, I'm literally, he's a fucking nightmare to work for. Not a bad guy, just a nightmare to work for. <laughs> right. Micromanaging psychopath. Yeah. I mean, dude, one time my friend took notes of how many times he called from the shift commander's office to the radio desk in one shift. It was 39 oh. times he called oh, to see what was going yeah, on. on the What's that guy doing in the back? What's he doing there? Where's so-and-so? Where's this person? Oh. 39 times in a 10-hour shift he called. That's three times an hour just go to for bed. the radio guy, almost four times an hour, right? <laughs> but he went to a leadership school, and he made a joke. I overheard it to another uh, supervisor with a sergeant or lieutenant. He said, no, he went to this school. He's like, and I'm kind of doing his voice. He's like, I'm, I'm exactly opposite of everything they said I should be. He's oh. like, I'm literally just the opposite. And he didn't care. He, but they, like, yeah. they, they gave him leaderships and he's like, I do everything the opposite of what they say. Yeah. And the sinful part about that is that he didn't care. So if you're not self-aware, that's one thing, you know, that's, that's tough. Right. But if you're self-aware and I, and I've said, you know, I've been saying this for years since, since leadership's gotten big on, you know, you look at the top 10 books at Barnes and Noble, the top 50 in Amazon, they're all leadership. All the knowledge is out there. The information of how to lead properly, it, everybody has access to it. The difference in the proper leaders versus suboptimal leaders is execution. Just doing it. Like he, he knew what to do. They were telling him what to do at a school he paid to go to. And he's basically saying, I'm exactly not like that, which should give him a goal. And he says, I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't, I, I have a hard time. That That's challenging to me. I just, I, dis, I disapprove of that. Well, people uh, say to me sometimes like, oh, you know, our, our, our chief, uh, he's not a big fan of yours. And I say, I had just, by saying that alone, I know exactly who your chief is. Yeah, there is no. I know who your chief is, and I got to tell you, I know he doesn't misunderstand me. Sure. I know who your chief is. Your chief is the guy that behaves the way that I say you shouldn't behave like. Yeah. And now he's being called out. Now he knows people are looking at him, going, 
yeah, this is our guy or your lieutenant or your sergeant or your captain or your coworkers. We're saying if you're going to be this, you need to be this. If yeah. you're not being this, tell me why you think doing it that way is working when for fucking ever it has failed us completely. Yeah. And because of people like you, we got cops at the worst case sticking pistols in their mouths. Right. If you don't think administrative assholes don't contribute to why police officers take their lives. Yeah. Uh, you are out of your goddamn fucking mind. Yeah. And I, I couldn't be more. And I say that with foul language because how do it's you have such you're right? How do you it have be how do you have no compassion yeah. and knowing that your behavior and how bad it is yeah. uh, creates thoughts of suicide, but you still show up with no concern, no responsibility, like, oh, whatever, I'll do it. Bro, yeah. it's fucked up. I, and I hear from guys like when it happens around here, like, well, the administration was riding them hard. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, these guys don't know what to do. I can't yeah. imagine what that's right. like. And they got to stick a fucking pistol in their mouth. Yeah, I, yeah I've, I've, I've said this for years, too. I, I imagine a world where all of our headaches are outside. All of our headaches come from the bad guys, the criminals, the you know violent crime problems. But it's not. It's a lot of self-inflicted. We call them self-inflicted wounds. One of my best friends um, was a captain here. And he, he said, man, another self-inflicted wound, you know, administrative nonsense. Like, like you said, reasonableness should be the key, but um, it should it should not be like that. And it and it hurt. It hurts my soul to hear that that stuff is goes on everywhere. I hate well, it. Well, let me heal you. Let me heal your soul a little bit, because I could tell you right now, as we continue to plant seeds across the country. Yeah. Um, you know, I often remind people that, like, I'm not here to try to convince the existing status quo. I'm not here to convince your existing guard. And I see these guys, I just know exactly who they are yeah. and girls. I'm not believing, I'm not excusing some of the women in this, in this profession and these sure. top levels. They're like junkyard dogs, bro. You can't take them home. You can't take a dog who's been in a junkyard for 12 years, barking at everybody, getting beat and behind scraps and take it home and turn it into a family dog. It don't work like that. Sure. Yeah. We even had it here. We brought somebody in who was getting their butt kicked in corporate for 15 years, came in here. She was allowed to do her first um, like meeting with the team that she was supposed to have, bro. I was at the end. I'm like, what the fuck was that? She's like, was that bad? I'm like, Are you fucking kidding me? Wow. Like wow. you literally asked people what they thought. They raised their hand. You went, no, wrong. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, um, what are you doing? So, but dude, months and months and months of trying to work with this girl, trying to yeah. get. And what I realized was like, she was just so beaten up. But the cool thing I see now is the new generation, right? Yeah. I would say the guys and girls that we, in the past 10 years, when we get into their brains and I'm watching it here in Jersey because where I started, you got chiefs now. Yeah. Captains, deputy chiefs, all these guys, sergeants, lieutenants, and bro, they believe what you and I believe. Yes. And I'm, I get calls from chiefs. Hey man, I got an idea. Um, we've never had a proactive patrol division here. Um, what's your thoughts? My thoughts, you want to get more people to come. And this actually ties back to our original conversation. So you want to, you don't got more money to give people, right? You guys don't have everything. You don't have all the specialized units some of these guys are looking for. Yeah. I go, but you got some stuff you could work with. I go, you know, Mike, why don't you uh why don't you put a thing out that every week, you know, it's not a big agency, 21, 22 guys. I go, every week, two guys or four guys can take a shift each, even for comp time. Uh, come in, their choice, plain clothes, tack gear, whatever you want. Yeah. And they don't answer calls, but they go out and they're just proactive yep, for a shift. Hands. Yep, exactly. Give them, give them 10 hours of overtime outside of the 40 hours. Yep. Uh, you could sell it to the town. The town don't got the money for it. Comp time, right? It'll be time for time. We got to give them time and a half. We'll get time back. That yep. it, it won't create any other overtime. We'll, we'll make sure it's scheduled on certain days. And he goes, uh, he goes, what do you think that's going to do? I can think about it, right? Nobody in this state or most police departments don't have a proactive unit. Yep. Everybody who wants to be the police you take a guy like me, oh, chomping at the bit to go out and catch bad guys. That's right. I catch wind that this agency has a proactive unit where you get to come in and wear a tack vest and a drop oh, yeah. holster I'm and there. go out and professionally find criminals, yes. lock them up, bring them in for comp time. I'm literally going to shove my chief off a cliff and start <laughs> running towards that police department. So <laughs> right. I said, it, does two, it does two things for you. Anybody who doesn't want to do this job and took it because they need to like work traffic and they want good benefits – um, you know, off-duty jobs and all that bullshit. Yeah. Those guys will never come to an agency like yours because they'll be terrified. They'll be forced to work. 100%. I go, yeah. and every guy who's working at an agency or every girl's working at an agency that's a hard charger is yes. going to be drawn to you. You don't even call me anymore and say, do you have anybody good? I'm telling you, you do that. Rumor yeah. starts getting out. It's going to take a little bit. Yes. That that this police department has a proactive unit that goes out. You don't got to call it a specialized division. You could wear uniforms. You could do whatever you want with it. And bro, he goes, this is probably one. And I. 
uh, Corey, I mean, I pulled this one out of my ass. I just came out of nowhere. And I goes, it's fucking genius, dude. And I said, yeah, he goes, I'm going to do it. Then he called me back like a week later. He's like, what do you think it should look like? I'm like, this is what I think. He's like, bro, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it. I go, you will never, you'll never have problems trying to find the people that you're looking for. Cause he wants right. good cops. Right. Uh, t- yeah. T- two things. First of all, you should send him an invoice for the consulting. Uh, second of all, the, um, I, I wrote an article for police magazine. It'll be coming out soon. And, and it's about the, the same idea. Everybody that takes this shield, everybody that puts a shield on, you know, is, is in, in my opinion, just like we give them the benefit of the doubt. They're admirable, valorous Americans. It separates us. But then there are fur- there are folks that progress further down that line and they become cops and f- crime fighters. And those are the ones that make the difference. Like you're talking about, they're the ones that want to proactively go out there. And, you know, those are the folks that we want to draw. Uh, a, lot, a lot of times people say, you know, w- whatever the industry, you know, people are the most important resource. And that's just wholeheartedly not true. The right people are the most important resource, right? So we want to draw those people in. And the, what you've described for him is, is going to attract the type of people that they want. And that's wise. That's a good use of energy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, it's when everybody's got to start thinking outside the box. And I've said this now with these issues of police recruitment, you no longer can expect that you're going to just put something out and people are just going to come to your door, That's right. you know, and, and throw in $7,500, $5,000 at these guys, you're getting their attention, but they still ain't doing it. Yeah. You're going to have to go above and beyond. It is cutthroat out there now. Yeah. And you can work with what you have. You can start getting creative. You can show things like administrative support. We're proactive going after criminals. Yeah. We're not heavy handed in internal affairs. Morale. If yeah. you could sell morale, Huge. Huge. You don't need to get 28% raises. Nope. You don't have to compete with down the road at Dallas PD. Yep. You will, on your reputation alone, get yep. people interested leaving Dallas. Yep. And I'm not using Dallas for any other reason. Right. You will get your reputation of, you'll have guys coming from Dallas to yep. your PD yep. for 28% less because they want to do police work because people yep. are purpose-driven. Yep. Money's just a bonus when you're happy. That's all it is. Yeah, for Money's sure. Money's just a bonus. Yeah. yeah. And the morale is for, you know, we talk about a pal of mine, we call it free morale. I mean, it, you know, the idea that just recognizing folks for the work they're doing, empowering them, pushing responsibility down as far as you, if you, as you comfortably will, like giving ownership, you know, as low in the ranks as you can. And then again, giving folks the benefit of the doubt when they make a good hearted mistake, you're not hammering them. Um, and, you know, showing up, you know, the bosses that show up to the third shift lineup, just to you know, hand somebody an employee of the month award—that's big stuff. It's free morale. It costs you nothing. Um, but showing, you know, like showing the folks that what you do actually matters, as opposed to like you know, I think a lot of people are put off by you know whatever it is—a holiday email from you know the boss of whatever all the way down. Hey guys, thanks for holding it. You know, I mean, that serves a purpose. I get it. Uh, but showing up, rubbing elbows, and you know, actually being genuine and saying this is like you guys are vi- you're vital. You're you're the thin dividing line between civil society and chaos, right? We know that's true. Say it, like put it out there, and that, like you said, that morale, folks hear about that, and they will be drawn to your agency based on the healthiness of your morale. That's true. Oh, and I got to tell you, just the opposite, brother, because there's agencies here in New Jersey. I could tell you who they are right now. That motherfucker, dude. It's hard to get a job here. Mm-hmm. And they can't even get people to interview at their agencies. And they're high paying wow. because their reputation is so bad yep. that people are like, I ain't fucking working here. Like sure. people are like ready to take jobs in the inner city, getting bullets whizzing past their heads before going to this beautiful part of the state yep. with a six figure salary, brand new equipment. But know that these people are yes. lunatics and they are fucking writing people. So their game is they're writing people up, suspending them like, dude. Something that would happen where I worked, like you probably just get like, yo, don't fucking do that again. Like, yeah. well, it was, it was an honest mistake. Yeah, no, we got, we know it was, dude. Don't worry about it. Like yeah. just, if you're looking for that on the left, pay attention to the right. Cause you know, you hit that fucking telephone pole and that car was brand new. Yeah. They were a little irritated, but they understand things happen. Right. Reason. Them 30 day suspension. Wow. Right. Yeah. Like 60 day, 60 day rips for new guys. Wow. So that starts to spread and it, yeah. you can't shake that rip. You know, you got to convince people once you've got a reputation like that. It's twice you as know how, how much work you got to put out there. Yep. Like, hey, that chief's gone. Hey, that lieutenant's gone. Hey, they're kicked out. We had a new mayor come in. They found out the bullshit that was going on. They're yep. fucking gone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the new guy we got is good. But, dude, you got to convince people. And even yep. the people that you're working for you, they're like beaten souls. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
and it like, takes hey, we want you to go out and do work, work, right? Yeah, and it takes yeah. time and effort. It takes two or three times the effort to rebuild that morale and time and time we don't have right now, right? Everybody's in a you know hiring or staffing crisis. We don't have that time, so the morale can't take a hit. I just think it's I just think it's important. Like we're we are as human beings, real quick to criticize people when they do something wrong. We should at least be, and particularly as cops, be at least that fast to tell people when they're doing the right thing. It's free. It's free morale. It costs nothing. Um, and we're poor at it and we should be better at it. Now I'm talking to me too. I'm not talking, you know, I should be better at it too. Listen, man, if you're a leader and you're not constantly trying to improve and, you know, I always tell people here, I, it, listen, I, I make mistakes. This is what it is, but I, uh, nobody in this office has seen me one scream or yell, yes. act emotional. And they all know that like, Maybe my decision wasn't perfect, but it's never malicious and it's always with my heart. And sometimes, and I hate to sound like a typical bullshit leader, in a small business, everybody's got to count. And if people can't fit the bill of what we need here, they can't be here anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's fair. It's it, and, and at least in business like this, I don't have like, um, you know, the union protections where I got to, right. you know, I, I talk to guys here like, dude, we, we might hire five people. And we get one fuckhead and we're stuck with that fuckhead for 25 years. Wow. Yeah. You know, like, so we can't get rid of them. We can't, yeah. you can't get them in the probation period. And you got to build a case on these guys to get rid of them. Wow. There's nothing we can do. We're stuck with these mopes. You can look at four, right. You think you got them all right. And then the one comes out, he's a bum. She's a bum. Yeah. And we're stuck with this bum and they start to collect and the bums find the other bums, you know? Hell yeah. And, and, there's and a they lot start of to gang up. Yeah, there's you know I'm a, I'm a fan and an anti fan. Like I, there's pros and cons of everything, including union you know unions in that in that in that situation. That's tough, man. Uh, we need the right people, you know. Period. That's that's important. Yeah, it's hard. And you know, honestly, uh, in places like North Carolina, the one thing that just comes to my mind is always the pay. Yeah, uh, you guys are significantly. And I don't know how Greensboro is, but yeah. significantly, North Carolina. It's historically known. You guys are probably some of the worst paid in the country. Yeah, it's, you know, it is, it's, it's a challenge and it's starting to, you know, agencies are, are, are pushing more aggressively, which, you know, a rising tide helps all ships. And so we all right. benefit from that. Um, you know, and, and the other side of that, and this is going to be unpopular, which I don't, you know, I don't care. Um, you know, I, I think particularly like teachers, cops, you know, folks that have heavy influence on human beings, I think you need to pay them. You need to pay them an amount that makes sense. That is, that is rewarding enough for the hard job they do. What you don't need to do is overpay them to the degree that you start drawing the wrong people into the job, right? If you if we, we paid you know cops and teachers here 150 grand to start, like you would draw people into the into the profession that is a real vital profession for the wrong reasons. And so you got to be wise with that. But yeah, we're finally starting to get you know to catch up. And and I got to make this point though, you know our, our taxes and our standard of living is probably one sixteenth of where you guys are too. So I won't say that like it is it egregious. You don't want to go down you don't want you don't want to go down that road, uh Corey, because I'll fucking I know uh, I don't want to put you in a bad <laughs> No 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 because like dude like yeah they are there's expenses to live here but like you're doing a 20 25 year career look around who the fuck's living in North Carolina now. That's a good point. No that's a good yeah. point. Yeah now I want to say on the other side yeah. of the coin I'm gonna play devil's advocate and then we're going to wrap and have to do this a second version of it. I'm sure you'll want to come back on. I, yeah, I want cool, you to come dude. back on. We'll yeah, do this shit all the time. You might be my permanent fucking co-host. That's we'll good. see. You know. Yeah. When you say that we got to care, be careful how much we pay them. Let's first of all say that we know that nobody's ever going to get paid more in the public sector than they can in the private sector if they're worth it. Yep. Now, there is some problem with some of the theory there in the sense that let's take our prosecutors, for example, and I'm going to tread lightly on this. If prosecutors were paid a significant amount of money, what, you know, high paying attorneys make, yes. you would have some real qualified stellar killers. I'm not saying there isn't a fucking fraction of them out there. Like we talking like a sprinkled dash full of salt yep. granules of prosecutors that are good. Yeah. Um, you. you would probably have good prosecutors and you have a lot of stuff being prosecuted appropriately. But what happens is, and you know, you've been around long enough that when these people have talent, at some point, the money comes into play in there and morals do go out the window. Uh, yeah. I don't mean the sense of like, they wanted to help put bad guys away. I've had friends that are minded of prosecutors. Like, look, I like being a prosecutor. I love the police. Yeah. I'm making 68,000 a year. I got offered a job from a firm at 294. Yeah, no, for like, sure. Yeah. You know, so, so when you say like, I also think on the other side of the coin is like, who are we attracting at 38,000 a year, right? Yeah, but who right. are we attracting yeah. at- a comfortable living when you're somebody who's a brain like mine or a brain like my best friends who are lieutenants sure. and sergeants, like yeah. these motherfuckers are like 
even now making 175, 180 as sergeants and lieutenants in New Jersey a wow. year. Yeah. Sorry to break that to everybody. Yeah, wow. They're just like, yo, I feel like I'm sold short. Like, I feel like I could have made three, 400,000 out into my 40s. I'm like, you could have. You, right? you could have. Yeah. And it, there's a trade off for sure. Yeah. Because, you know, and, and I'll tell you, man, I've got pals that do. I mean, I've got pals that make ungodly money. Right. But we get together. And uh, again, they want to hear our stories. So that's part of the trade. This job. Right. You know, no question about it. Yeah. So we can say that like you can overpay. We, yeah. Yeah. But are you, but I think that also if you had more investing, you might get better candidates. That's true. right. Yeah. They're you're, dropped. You're right. I, I think it would I, cast a wider net, especially with kids coming out of school with all this debt and everything else. Bro, I mean, you yeah, know, you right. want to go get a job. If you're looking at a job, you got you got Amazon starting at 45, 50. You got sure. agencies, you got yeah. cops leaving to go be to go work at Walmart for twenty one dollars an hour because the PD pays thirteen eighty two. Wow. Wow. You know, like that's a real thing, dude. Chattanooga, yeah. Tennessee. I was talking to a guy a couple of years ago. Their patrolman top pay was like thirty eight thousand bucks a year. I'm like, that's a big agency. Bro. That's a large agency. Wow. They don't make anything. I, wow. I'm in Alabama. They're like, we make like fourteen dollars an hour. Oh, I'm yeah, like, that, bro, that's the, the minimum. But my point is, is like. When you have cops leaving and going to take jobs as clerks at fucking Walmart because they pay 21 or sure. going to Costco or Home Depot because they pay 35, 40 <laughs> percent more. Yeah. When you're making fucking peanuts and you're starving, yeah. any little extra peanuts going to count. 100%. You know, yeah. when you start getting into big numbers, there's not a big difference between making 400 and 600,000 a year or yeah. your lifestyle doesn't change dramatically from four million to eight million years. Crazy as that sounds. Yeah, no, you're right. Yep. Right. But, but not that I make four or $8 million here, believe me. Um, <laughs> but I'm saying like at that level, you know, when, when big box stores like target are drawing police officers yes, because the agencies, the towns, the politicians don't want to invest in their police. And yep. then they complain, well, yep. they're not trained. They're not physically fit. Motherfucker. You guys just built a $28 million complex to, for a political reason. Yes. And you got cops who, you have potential great police officers that would have taken this job if you could have gave them a decent fucking yeah. salary. It's Nobody's asking for 150 yeah. in Greensboro, North Carolina, but All I right. think they'd like to see 65, 70. I think that's fair anywhere. Yeah, right. Sure. I think I think at a yeah. very minimum, everybody should be making 65, 70 as a cop to start minimum. I don't yeah. care where the fuck you live. Right. And God bless everybody else who does. 150 to 200 right yeah. god bless them right i think that's totally fair and that's always the, like the, the salary particularly starting salary it's always the big gun um you know I, I send my recruiters all over the southeast and um and elsewhere and you know they i, I tell them like talk about the schedule our schedule is great uh answer questions about the salary um but that's always the big gun that's what captures people's attention is that salary that immediate dollar figure and so does now know, we can't it neglect. does now because people have options uh yeah, Corey. for sure the internet's around people yeah. have options you can go exactly. fucking hustle on amazon be an amazon ambassador making yeah. fucking 60 grand a year so right. they could do that at home or come to work and have some guy with chevrons tell them they're a piece of shit every day <laughs> treat them like a fucking <laughs> like they're on the bottom of their sole of their shoe right or Absolutely. they can just be self-employed so you know it's not this game anymore of like I need a job. This is the best place to go. It's a steady sure. pay. People have options, folks. We have the internet. That's, That's right. why people are leaving these major cities and working on in locations that are tropical and vacation like because That's they can right. work from there. Yep. You don't have to show up to fucking. And so and guess sure. what? Now, now you got agencies recognizing that there is somebody else who will treat you better. Yeah. So when these agencies go, we just lost 16 guys this month. How is that possible? Look in the fucking mirror. How is that possible? Yeah. Why do they have them 10 fucking 10, 10 counties down? Why do they take every or 10 cities down? Yes. Why is all your personnel going there? And well, you can't keep anybody. Yeah, I'm well, they make they make 4% more. No, they don't. That has <laughs> nothing to do with it. You guys have more off-duty work. Right. That yeah. has nothing to do with it. The fucking dollar 12 an hour has nothing to do with it. That's right. Something's wrong at your agency. Yeah. And if you guys are too uh, self-fulfilled and don't have enough humility to recognize that. I hope the politicians catch on to why the fuck if you, you have cops leaving the agency nonstop, there's a significant fucking problem. And it's time to fix the leak. And sometimes mm. it's telling the chief, get the fuck out, get this. You might take, take a guy right from the ranks, Sergeant, Lieutenant guy like Corey and go, you're going to be the next chief. We need a guy like you and you'll fix the problem. You'll plug the fucking holes. Got a guy mm. like you's competent enough to do that. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, I think, yeah, like, like we said a bit ago, like everybody knows the right thing. It's just all about executing it at this point. So, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's, it's tough times, man, for sure. I, I'll tell you this, you know, I am always encouraged seeing the folks come in, um, you know, a couple of years ago during all the George Floyd riots and stuff, I was one of the watch commanders 
Um, and we had significant property damage and, you know, arrests and like mayhem, chaos, like true anarchy. Um, and, you know, I would see these 21 year old, 22 year olds getting rocks, bottles thrown at them, spit on, screamed at for 20 hours a day. And then I saw them come back like they come back every day. Like they get out of, think about that. They That's miraculous. They get out of bed, a 21 year old, 22 year old, they get out of bed knowing what today holds and they did it again and again and again. And they did it for weeks. If you took a typical car salesman and you said, Hey pal, just want to let you know um, today at your sales office, you're going to have probably a riot, people screaming vindictives at you. Um, just want you to know, you know what that dude's going to do? Call in sick. You know what we don't do? And what I would not see these young folks do is, is coward from that. That's, that's miraculous. And, and reason for a lot of hope in my opinion. And that was great for me to, to see that. I like watching that. It's amazing. And, and administrations better be fucking kissing their fucking feet for the rest of their careers and not forgetting that yeah. when they needed them, they showed up. So you better be showing up for them when you, when you, when they need you. Yeah. And so that's valid. the truth, yeah. man. You yeah. got, don't forget about it. Right. Don't you were out there. Don't you dare forget what you put, what these people went through and how proud you were then. Let's not fucking forget about that. When you're ready to fucking hammer this dude down with a 10 day rip on some bullshit yeah. when you don't have to, but you do because you're trying to set precedent and his fucking family don't get to go to vacation this year. Cause you're a dick. Yeah. So right. no, take care I, listen, I'm not saying we don't need accountability. I'm just saying like, 100%. You need to understand the difference between malicious police behavior that needs yes. to be addressed immediately and swiftly yep. kicked or removed from the yep. agency and a guy who made a mistake. Yep. Car crashes happen, right? Yep. You're on the road fucking 16, 8 to 16 hours a shift. Yeah, These things are going to happen. That's You've right. got to look at those and go, we know you didn't mean it. Now the guy yep. crashes four cars in a month. You got a problem. You got to solve the now problem. Now we're going to take this yep. fucking guy and or girl and stick her inside. I got to do something with her. Yeah, get her a bike. Yeah. I don't know. For sure. But, it, you know, in 2023, in the chapter of American history we're in, folks that choose to enter this profession and wear this shield, like I'm fully prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt. I think that's fair. I think that makes sense. Start with giving them the benefit of the doubt. They entered this arena in this chapter to do this kind of work. Um, like they're the best of the best. You give them the benefit of the doubt, at least you're always fair, but yeah, you know, be reasonable, right? That makes sense. Oh, uh, Lieutenant Flowers, you bring out the very best of me. I, I appreciate, appreciate that. You. Good. We're gonna do this again. Just we're gonna get it scheduled up. I appreciate you being here, man. Uh, mm -hmm. listen for episode two. I never put two of two because who knows? I think Corey's gonna be a recurring character on the Street Cop <laughs> podcast. And I appreciate your time, man. And, um, it's real pleasure meeting you. I hope we get to meet you in uh, real life. I imagine you and at least a hundred of people from the Greensboro Police Department come to the Street Cop Conference. So I'll cool, see you man. There. I love it. Thanks, Dennis. Good work. All right, brother. I'll see you. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now and then... You could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.